Either we take hold of the future or the future takes hold of us. Either we see the future as something which comes towards us, which we have to react to and prepare for and exploit as an opportunity, as a trend, or we say MTN, the great innovator telecom company, you are creating the future. You are designing the new products, the processes, which are going to drive how people actually live. And that is really what the future is all about. I'm going to divide the future into six phases. They spell the word future, and as I say, I hope they will provide a framework for much of the rest of what will happen. And the first phase of the future is fast, and it's to do with the speed of change. And I don't need to talk to you about that. But the fact of the matter is that your future will be largely shaped by the decisions which this generation are going to make over the next five to ten years. And just about everyone is trying to outguess how they will actually live. And the challenge is this, that many things can change faster even than you can develop a policy or a process. Now that's a very big challenge for you. It's actually the greatest challenge for you. It's staying ahead of consumers who can jump 35 years of technology in three and a half hours. Someone like my mother, and my mother, I used to think that mobile phones were the sort of things that you didn't use. She used to say that she would never go online to trade stocks and shares using the internet because she knew people who had lost money. And yet, one day she phoned me up and she said, Patrick, actually, I, I've changed my mind. I think uh, I'm missing out on all my friends' uh, hospitality and social arrangements uh, because I'm not on email and I don't have SMS. So can you take me to the shop and buy me the very latest? And you know what? In three and a half hours, she jumped 40 years. She came back with a mobile phone, Windows XP Professional, a nice smart laptop. She said she wanted a broad laptop, but she didn't know what she meant. And she came back with broadband, wireless broadband, oh, and a video camera, because she said she wanted to go skipping, but she didn't know what that meant either. So now she has Skype, video links, and does it all in the garden. Now, she jumped. 35 to 40 years in three hours, she left all her, her friends behind with shock, but also many of her business colleagues too. The future is full of uncertainties and certainties. You know the telecom costs are going to carry on falling towards zero, which will be a challenge for you. You know that there will be the most amazing jump in the capacity of every handheld device, which is an opportunity for you. But at the same time, there are things that we don't know. I spend my life not at the center of this screen. I spend my life on the outer edge of the radar, looking at low probability, unlikely events. But if they happen, they could totally change your world. And in the empty end world, in every one of your territories, we could find hundreds of such wild cards, each of them quite unlikely to happen. But you can do the maths. If each of them is a 1% risk in a country like Nigeria, and there are two or 300 of these things, then the chances of one of these factors affecting you somewhere in your business becomes very high. So we need to be creative, adaptive, flexible, responsive, and ready for all kinds of opportunities. And the future will be driven by one word. And it's not technology. It's not even MTN. The future, my friends, will be driven by emotion. History shows us that it's the emotional reactions to events which actually shape our world. It was emotion that made my mother jump 40 years of technology. It wasn't that she's a techno geek and she likes playing with toys. It is emotion, which is the reason why many people in my country will use chat if they are teenagers and they have five or ten chat screens open at once. Because they find that chat 
can be a very emotionally intense experience. Maybe you don't feel the same way because you're a bit older generation. But it's emotion which meant that WAP died on mobile phones. It's emotion uh, and, and, uh, uh, that causes us to see what technologies survive and which don't. That's why we don't believe market research. Market research can't tell you MTN's future. All market research does is it tells you what your customers used to think about the future, and of course, they're usually wrong. They may be right about the next year, but they're probably not right about two or three years' time. Let me give you another example from France. I know it's not uh, particularly relevant outside of South Africa, but it would be a, an example here too. In France, one in 12 of all web users write a web diary, a blog. One in 12. And yet, if you had asked people in France three years ago whether they would ever have done such a thing, they would have thought you were crazy. So we listen to our customers, we get close to them, listen to my mother, please, but just don't believe what she says. We build an image of what her life is like, then, using your techno vision, we build a vision of future that my mother may live in, and we try to imagine how she will behave in that place, and that gives us a different view. I'm going to give you another example of this. I'm going to show you a video to, which was a TV advertisement that was banned in my country. You see, one of the challenges is that culture is also emotional, and we have many cultures in this room, and even, and you're going to hear about more about this from Fonz tomorrow, but even within one culture like the UK, there are hundreds, in this country, SABC broadcasts in 13 languages, and that's just a few of the language groups here in South Africa. So culture can be complicated. Market research gave a general answer, and they said, this is a fantastic video, let's show it. The moment it was shown, there was a huge emotional reaction. The video was banned. I thought you'd like to see it. One or two of you may have seen it already. I hope it doesn't cause any offense to any of you, but it's an important business principle because there's a lesson here about how you can think you've got it right with your data, then you can do something and find yourself on a different planet. Here is the video. I want you to watch it and then think about why was it banned. So what do you think? I mean, why, why do you think this was banned? Any ideas? They had huge numbers of complaints about this video, even though, you know, wherever I show it to executive audiences, they usually think it's quite funny. So any ideas why you think it might have been banned? What do you think? Actually, there are many reasons, I think. Any ideas? What do you think? You seem very silent. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because of the gruesome nature of it. The gruesome nature of it, yes, I think that might have been one reason. You make it so fast. It, it contains something which is true about life, which is that every year, New Year's Day comes round a whole week earlier than the year before. Life is speeding up. And uh, you know what? That is often uh, because of technology. And, uh, SMS, we should not underestimate the impact of the technologies that you create on culture. Now, the fact 
that when I visited this wonderful country, which I love so much, when I was first 18 years old, I came here. In those days in the town sky in Umtata, if a wheel came off a Land Rover and you were late for a meeting, the people would wait for three days for you to come. Because they had traveled two days to be at the meeting, and they thought you were coming this morning. And when you're not coming, and you're not coming, and there is no communication method, they will stay waiting because, of course, you may come in the next hour, and they spent two days getting there. You imagine the change now, and you know that within a few seconds, however de uh, deprived economically that group is, they will know exactly where we are, what has happened, they will be able to send help for us, and we are now dealing, even in the poorest communities, with a total just-in-time culture. And that is a dramatic change. And in the more affluent communities, you know, if people go to an MTN website and your page takes more than 30 seconds to load, you've just lost 30% of your entire sales. Why? Because life is speeding up. Let me ask for a show of hands here. Um, who here has been at a conference or stayed in a hotel where people are queuing for a lift and you've pressed the button more than once? Put your hands up. <laughs> Look, why do we do it? I do it as well. Why do we press the button more than once? I tell you why. Because the future is not about logic, it's about emotion. There is no logical reason to press the button again. We know that. It is totally crazy, isn't it? And yet most people here will do a crazy thing when we are pressured by time. Now, and uh, you know, even in a place like DRC, my wife and I were in DRC, Congo, on a humanitarian project just last week. Even there, where nothing seems to work, Telecom works. It's one of the miracles of modern day that in total chaos in a country, mobile instant telecom works to anyone uh, around the world. Now, convergence, divergence, what do we mean? Yes, everything's converging, but it's also diverging. I, was, I want to suggest to you that while a lot of things are converging, all true innovation that you do will be about divergence. It will be about doing something special and doing it different. Differentiating yourselves from the others. Having something which is absolutely right for that target group rather than just a billing model inherited from the first world. And convergence wins for the consumer when it makes life simpler. But often convergence makes life more complicated. Put your hands up if you have functions on your mobile phone that you never use. Put your hands up. Okay, a sensitive question. Put your hands up if there are functions on your phone that you just don't understand. My friends, I want to come back to this as a problem in a minute. You see, you are the world's most technological people on the earth. You know more about telecom and mobile phones than anyone else but most of you in this room don't understand the technology that you have in your pockets. I don't want to be rude, but I'm saying that this is an issue. It's a challenge at the bottom of the pyramid, especially. And most people want a product to do just one thing and do it really well, which is why the future will be many, many, many more products, as well as sometimes multiply functioning them. But who really wants a web-enabled fridge? I mean, really. You know, what a crazy idea. I've had web-enabled web uh, dustbin in my, my kitchen for years. It's a complete waste of time. The idea is you click and throw. When you throw it away, another one comes through the door the following day. No, my friends, sometimes we go stark, raving, technology mad. And we lose touch with what is actually going to make individual lives better at the right price. And then we have the confusion over size. Telecom companies can't work out which way to go. We get smaller and smaller until we can't touch the device at all. And then we get larger and larger. Put your hands up if you've decided that the next 
phone device you get needs to have a larger screen so you can write on it more easily. See, uh, it's, we are being stretched, therefore, in two directions, and speech recognition will always be limited in a noisy place, which means we have to have a keyboard, or we write. But you try writing on a little postage stamp PDA, it's almost impossible. So we're going heading for a world of keyboards significantly larger perhaps than they are, and screens which are much larger than they were in order to be able to drive all of these new channels, information streams, and revenue earners. At the same time as getting smaller, fast, urban. I will go through these other faces faster than the first. Urban is about demographics, fashions, and fads. Urban is about the fact that there are one billion children on the earth today and almost half of them are in this continent, and all of them will be adults in the next 15 years. This is the greatest growth of any market that has ever happened in human history. And, and with that, we are seeing urbanization on an unbelievable scale. And with urbanization comes a threat to mobile telecom. Let me explain. You do best where people can't get the landline where there is, I'm talking about rollout of next generation services, where the copper lines don't work, where there is no cable and the rest. But let me tell you, my friends, there is a mega monster of cable coming into Africa, Asia, and everywhere else, and it's going into these cities. These cities which will contain 750 million Africans alone by the year 2030, and that's just the start. Look at China. China, the great giant, is moving, uh, now moving 23 million new people from rural areas into cities every 12 months. And with these centers comes the opportunity for competition, for data flow. Now we live in a crazy world. A crazy world where soon there will be more mobile handsets than there are people on Earth. Already, we are in the age of three billion active handsets, which is quite extraordinary, considering that there are only four billion adults in the entire world today. What it means is this. You are becoming, in fact, you already were, but every telecom company is going to be an emerging telecom company. For a company like Nokia, almost all of their new handsets for new customers are likely to be for people on relatively low incomes, maybe less than $20 a day or something like that. I'm talking about the future. The Western market is dead. It's over, it's finished. Yes, you can try and squirt more megabits per second down the same pipe, but it's saturated as a market. But this, this emerging market is one which you understand and you are prime, primarily placed on and you will do very well in. But I've just come back to this issue again of simplicity. And I'm going to ask you a question which is too embarrassing now to put the hands up about. So if we could have the, uh, the electronic... Uh, poll charts up now. I want to ask a question, uh, if I could have the electronic uh, question up, please. I want to ask a question about PDAs and computers. And my question is this, if I could have it up, please. Where is it? No question. Oh, here we are. Have you had difficulties synchronizing your mobile phone with your computer? Have you had difficulties synchronizing your PDA with your computer? Have you found sometimes that it only partially synchronizes or it crashes or you have to reset the PDA to get it to work or it only, uh, you know, sometimes you've lost data or, or whatever. Um, maybe you've had to change even your mobile phone as a result. Um, uh, type yes or no. For yes, it's star 686, star 2, star 1. And for no, it's 686. Off you go. Uh, star 686, star 2, star 2, hush. Okay? So if you've had a difficulty in the last couple of years making the technology actually work, um, say yes. If you haven't, 
say no. All right, and we'll just uh, take a vote on this. Let me tell you that where I'm going to benchmark you against other conferences. In every conference I've ever spoken to with IT people, telecom people, the vast majority have had a serious problem. Um, it's quite extraordinary. Okay, so we had 166 votes in, 170, another two seconds will go, and then let's look at the result. Now, I realize this is biased because people who have the greatest difficulty may also have the greatest difficulty punching in the SMS vote. <laughs> okay, but let's have a look at the result now. 186 votes we've had in, and let's look and see. Oh, my word, I hope, this, I hope there's no media here today. I hope there's no one from the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal. I hope there's no one from uh, SABC who's going to do a broadcast about this because this is a shocking scandal, is it not? Hello? Isn't it? Hello? Put your hands up if you've been frustrated to the point of real annoyance over this issue. Put your hands up. Come on, my friends. You see, the future is about emotion. And when systems destroy my data or waste my time, I get very emotional about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> but my friends, you know what? I don't think we should be even selling these systems. If you can't do it, how can my mother do it? Please. If you can't do it, how can someone at, who, at the bottom of the pyramid, aspiring middle class person in their first degree un, at university, possibly hope to do it? And yet, this is one of the most important things in the digital age. Talk about convergence, and we can't even make the data communicate. So, my friends, let's work hard at this, shall we? Let's make the product simple. Why don't we, you know, we, let's, have, let's, let's, let's start from the scratch. Why don't you work with the handset makers? Maybe you are already to completely design a handset which is ideal for a $5 a day individual. And let's roll them out. You know there are $100 computers about to be launched across the whole of Africa. $100, complete system, and with a hand-wired thing for electricity. If we can do that for an entire PC, then my goodness, my friends, we can totally reform and reinvent the telecom mobile business and create innovative products which will blow the socks off every other telecom company in the world, especially when we fit it together with pricing structures which are appropriate for that market. Now, on the urban face, I want to just say something else, which is the AIDS challenge is a big one. I just want to make one comment, which is that my wife and I have been fighting this illness for many years, since 1988. In many of your territories, up to a third of all the people who have an account have the virus already. And another third over the next 20 years may get it. And you are well positioned with SMS to send out all kinds of free educational messages and the rest. I'm sure you're already doing it, but let's do it more. And let's kick AIDS out of Africa, like we've seen in Uganda, with a dramatic fall in HIV from 22% down to 7%. Fast urban tribal. Tribalism is the most powerful force in the world today. It's more powerful than atomic bombs or the entire military might of every nation. Tribalism is when one group says we are us and you are them. Watch out for some instabilities as a result of increasing gap between the wealthy and the poor inside countries and between them. I once asked one of the largest uh, energy companies in the world how many people it would take to stop all oil extraction in the whole of Nigeria, which is the seventh largest producer? The answer was just 50. 50 activists with machine guns and cigarette lighters would be enough to knock out the whole of that production for a decade. Tribal leadership is about the most powerful positive force in the world. It's about culture, team, belonging, relationship, commitment, neighborhood, family, language, um, and it's about keeping close to our customers. It's about, in a saturated world where there are so many voices, it's about making sure that we target them with messages which are absolutely right. I'm not going to let's dwell any more on that. Fast urban tribal universal. That's about globalization and the massive economic impact which your technologies are having on emerging economies right now. Roaming issues are something which needs to be solved. At some point, we're going to need to grapple this issue, especially in regions in Africa, 
where, as you know, we're beginning to see things open up a bit. At the moment, it's mad that my friends who work in Uganda, they have five or ten SIM cards. Every time they go to a different country, they buy another SIM. This is crazy. They buy another SIM, maybe even with MTN, and then they use the local MTN system. Why, why not save them the travel? Since they can get cheap local calls using an additional SIM card for one dollar or something, for loads of calls, why not put it onto their account and let them roam and do the work for them? There are, there's no excuse, in my view, for this kind of system. We need to rationalize it. It makes no sense at all. The bottom of the pyramid you've already talked about last year, and it's going to be there big time in the future, especially in India, which really is the home of this issue. You probably know this story, this incredible story of this company, which couldn't sell uh, to women on low income shampoo because they couldn't afford to buy the bottle. So what they did was they poured the shampoo out into tiny sachets, and these sachets have a higher profit margin and produce most of the sales in revenue uh, of that company for shampoo today. The same thing is happening, of course, in telco, but I think we've only just begun. I think that one of the reasons is because the handsets themselves are too expensive for a bottom of the pyramid model. So we need to completely reinvent it. And yes, already many countries have jumped over the landline issue, uh, especially in a place like DRC, where nothing seems to work except your technology or someone else's wireless technology. But we need to watch out as well, as I say, for the new revolution of broadband that's going to come sweeping through many of these towns and cities in the high, higher net worth people. And when that happens, you're going to find handsets, already this is happening, handsets which go automatically on the internet the moment they are anywhere near a broadband transmitter. In their home, in the college, in the uh, cafe, or all the rest. The handset will go on the landline, it will go on the internet for free, for free Skype, and it goes on uh, your mobile network. So watch out, people are going to come and try and eat your business. Um, and yet, at the same time, we're going to see extraordinary new models of communication. I went into a hotel recently and I ran a 24-hour video link for three days. Why? Because it cost nothing. I just set it up between my home and where I was staying. It just ran there because the hotel gave me internet, I think, a total of $5 a day for unlimited use. I'm just going to skip through this one. Fast urban tribal universal radical. Radical is about single issue activism and the death of politics. Radical is about regulation. Radical is about licensing. Radical is about all kinds of, of barriers to entry and also major opportunities through political change. The old politics of left-right has been, has been put aside in most countries. And now we see politics of single issues. Single issues of environment, global warming, uh, and just about anything else. These issues will drive politics. They will drive the influences on your business, and what you can do and what you can't. Watch out for the electromagnetic issue. As a physician, I tell you, it is important. It's more important than you think. Not necessarily because there's any proof that it damages health, but remember, the future isn't about science, it's about emotion. And already there is a lot of emotion about electromagnetic radiation. And you will see more and more papers come out over the next few years which show a direct effect of mobile phone use, heavy mobile phone use, on human cells. You will see, I predict, some papers which will show significant evidence that there may be a small health risk for some people with heavy use. Will I stop using it? No. Will I take my mobile phone away from my children? No. Because the truth is, I think that the risk is very, very small. But remember, the future is about emotion, not necessarily logic. So watch out for that issue um, and be careful about it. And also, we need to be very careful and sensitive about the way we operate in different cultures, uh, respecting each other's communities uh, and ways of doing things. The biggest single issue of all for the next decade, without doubt, will be global warming, whether you agree with the science or whether you don't. 
And here you have as a telco an extraordinary opportunity. So much of what you do saves energy because you stop people from traveling. You make people efficient. And actually, so little of what you do consumes power because electronics doesn't need much compared to a plane. It would be very easy for you to become a totally carbon neutral company. I flew here on water power. My computer at the back there is running on wind power right now. And you say, how can this be? Because I worked out at the beginning of this year how many times I would fly to South Africa, China, India, Malaysia, Russia. I worked out how many tons of carbon I would use, also in taking a bath, in having a, a cooked meal, uh, in uh, the, the clothes that I clean, uh, my, and how much carbon my children would use. And then we invested an amount of money in hydroelectric schemes in a developing environment to convert something that wasn't commercially viable into something that really worked. And as that dam starts to produce electricity for a small community, those people stop burning carbon and we make a saving somewhere else in the world, which exactly balances the carbon that I use. You are already seeing the first world's first carbon airline has started to launch. See, all our flights are water powered. There is the first carbon neutral bank, HSBC. You have the opportunity, I think, if you wish, at almost zero cost, to become the first carbon neutral phone company, which is actually, we offset all of the energy we use everywhere in the world, including flying to conferences. It wouldn't be difficult to do. It would be fun. It would raise an issue. It shows that you're being corporately responsible and the cost issue would be almost nothing. For, in fact, on a cost of a flight to go from here to London, the cost is only $10 to make it neutral, even on a big flight. Fast urban tribal universal radical. Whew. How do we live in this crazy, crazy world? A world that's so fast, we can hardly think. A world that's so urban with its massive demographic challenges, including social challenges like AIDS. How can we live in a world where we seem to be so tribal that sometimes countries quite literally can fall to pieces? On the other hand, how can we live in a world which is so universal that sometimes we feel we are losing our own identity and culture? How do we live in a world which is so radical that small numbers of activists seem to gain huge power? The answer is we need ethics and values. Ethics is about the passion that we have. It's why we get out of bed in the morning. And we've been talking about ethics and values since the very start of this presentation. I just say this. You can listen to a grand strategy and you've had one this morning. You can listen to a tremendous vision and you've had one. But if the people you work with don't care, it's a waste of time. You will only bring change into your organization when people connect with your strategy because they believe in your vision, they believe it's going to make their world and other worlds a better place and they will work with you to transform it. Companies, publicly listed companies, tend to talk a last century language of profits, growth and shareholder value. But the people I talk to are talking a different language and it doesn't matter whether they're from Harvard Business School or London Business School, it doesn't matter if they live in the worst slums in Kolkata or in DRC. It doesn't matter if they're the CEOs of the largest corporations in the world. There is a different language being spoken. And it's not about shareholder value, bottom line profit, and the rest. I've never met, I don't think, a human being who gets out of bed in the morning and says, oh, thank God I'm alive today. Let's go and make more shareholder value and bottom line profit and Excel spreadsheet numbers. Put your hands up if you're such a person. But we go on about it quite a lot in our companies. So where is passion then? I'll tell you where passion is. You will find passion when people talk about themselves, their own needs, what they enjoy, the challenge of the job. You'll find passion when people talk about their families, about balancing the different things in their lives, about their children, their husbands, their wives, their partners, their parents, and their close friends. You will find passion when people talk about community. In fact, the vast majority of every conference I've ever talked to 
gives time to things that you really believe in. Now put your hands up if in the last two years you've done, I, I, wait for it first, put your hands up if in the last two years you've done something for nothing and MTN did not even pay you to do it, but you just did it. Maybe you shook a tin for the tsunami disaster or for the humanitarian crisis in Darfur. Maybe uh, you uh, help out with a small foundation and you do the accounts of a small charity that looks after AIDS orphans. And uh, maybe uh, you just uh, help do the shopping for an old lady. You hardly know her name, but she lives at the end of your street and she is very, very sick at the moment. Maybe you help out at your children's school or you're active in your church as I am or in the, uh, uh, the synagogue or the mosque or wherever it is that you're committed in whatever social group. If you have given time to something outside of your own self in the last two years, put your hands up now. Let's have a look. Have a look around. Now, my friends, it's almost everyone. And you see, some of you were too busy, so you outsourced it. You gave money away and someone else gave the time. Now, when you add those two things together, I see the true spirit of MTN, which is more than about making money out of, out of minutes on a phone. There is a passion in this room for a better kind of world, which is why you give time and why you give money. You don't have to do it, you're not paid to, but there is something inside you which drives you, and you will learn more about each other in 30 seconds sharing the stories about what you do or what you would like to do than in working with MTN for 10 whole years. This is passion. And that is the driving slogan, I believe, of every telecom company. What is it about? It's about making life better, as we heard earlier this morning. It's about building a better world. It's about connecting people together. It's about allowing people to know when the Land Rover is broken down. It's about taking someone to hospital in time. It's about sending a Valentine's Day card greeting at a cost which someone can afford. It's about allowing someone on $5 a day to run a global business and sell his products and services in London and Madrid using simply SMS to confirm the deal. My friends, you are in a great enterprise. Without mobile telecom, emerging companies will stall. With mobile telecom, with companies like MTN, reinventing products for emerging markets, you are in the business of building a better world, and I wish you every success in it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Peter. Uh, morning, bonjour, hello. Um, welcome to the 2007 uh, Leadership Conference. Uh, I, I know that a lot of people have traveled far and wide for this conference. Uh, we, we certainly hope that over the years we've been able to improve on the theme and the output and the outcome uh, every single year. And we, we certainly hope that uh, by the end of the day tomorrow, uh, you would have found it to be, to be worth your while. Can I um, really begin by, uh, first of all, work, welcoming very warmly uh, our um, CEOs and their teams from, from all the countries. Um, and of course, a very special welcome to, to the speakers uh, who have uh, found time to honor and grace us with their presence during this conference. Uh, we certainly look forward um, to your presentations over the next two days. Um, Dr. Patrick Dixon, uh, Mr. Sandeep Waslakar, Professor Nick Benadel, who's obviously uh, helped us on this conference over the last uh, two, three years. Mr. Daniel Burns, um, Professor Tarun Kana, Mr. Fons Tropenar, Dr. Moss Kantar, and Mr. Gerard Delanga. Uh, those are really our very esteemed speakers for this conference. Uh, please welcome them with a, a round of applause. Thank you very much. I think it is worth recounting 
you know, the purpose of this conference. Uh, the purpose of this conference really um, is, is firstly to allow us as a, as a group to co-create and chart a vision for the group going forward. Um, obviously, as the group becomes larger and larger, that becomes more and more of a challenge. But uh, we, we sincerely hope that we can structure it in a manner that allows us, um, you know, to, to come out with something that is productive. Secondly, we always use the outcomes and the resolutions taken out of this conference to do two things. I think firstly, to give the uh, group board some direction uh, in terms of their uh, direction to us as management uh, on the strategy for the group going forward. But secondly, it becomes a fairly important input in the budgets for the following year. So whatever we decide here and some of the themes that uh, come out of this uh, conference will certainly start finding their way into the budget for 08, which uh, we normally start putting together around uh, October of, of, of the year before. So really, you know, we don't want to see this as a talk shop. We really want to see as, as a conference that comes out with some real concrete um, uh, direction. And I think in the last uh, four conferences that we've had, we believe that it's been, it's been fairly, you know, fairly useful. I won't go through the last conferences that we had. Suffice to say that, uh, uh, you know, they were put on the screen. We started off with uh, talking about leadership for the future. I think that was 02002. Uh, then we spoke about growth. Uh, that was 03. Then we spoke about uh, how we deal with our customers. How does a customer in any one of these countries have a very similar experience in terms of uh, the MTN brand, quality of service, and so on. Uh, I think the example that I gave was one of Coke, to say if you, if you open a can of Coke, irrespective of where you are in the world, uh, you'll, have, you know, you'll, you, you'll expect the same experience, the same taste, and hopefully the same service. And that's what we, we, we aspire to. And of course, the last conference that we had last year was really talking about how do we service a much lower segment of, of customers. And I think we had some fairly interesting uh, speakers from India uh, that uh, spoke about uh, the bottom of the pyramid and how we could restructure ourselves um, to, to address that segment of the market. If one looks at our footprint today, um, you know, that's really the operations uh, that uh, represent MTN today. Um, West Africa, Southern Africa, uh, not as strong in East Africa, and certainly, um, you know, uh, four countries in the, in the Middle East. Uh, the key point on this slide is really to say those countries today cover a population of almost half a billion people. And I think, for me, that constitutes a very major opportunity which we've only started working on. Um, you know, we've only selling standard voice, SMS, et cetera, et cetera, but we haven't really restructured the organization to actually go far deeper and take far more uh, services to a lower segments of the market and therefore address the population of, of half a billion people. I think it is also clear from the map that um, there's an opportunity for further regional consolidation. We are a little bit scattered. Um, there are obviously countries that we would like to be in. I think if you look at uh, West Africa, um, a country like Senegal is still significant. Uh, notwithstanding that, we've got a continuous footprint, but uh, we'd like to obviously um, you know, find opportunities there so that uh, in dominating the region, we are able to perform what we call a hub and cluster. In other words, have critical mass in the region and have far more efficiencies in servicing you know, each region. Um, in Southern Africa, of course,